Welcome. Father Julian Caron was ordained in 1975. He graduated in 1976 in theology at the Comilias Pontifical University and earned a doctorate in scriptural the theology in 1984 from the Theological Faculty of Northern Spain. Since 2004, he has taught Introduction to Theology at the Catholic University of Milan, Italy. And since Father Giussani's death on Fe February 22, 2005, he has been president of the Fraternity of Communion and Liberation. In 2008, Pope Benedict appointed him as consultor to the Pontifical Council for the Laity. The same year, the Holy Father invited him to address the General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops on the Word of God in the Life and Mission of the Church. On May 2011, Benedict XVI appointed him consultor of the new Pontifical Council for the promotion of the new evangelization. On May 2012, the Catholic University of America bestowed an honorary degree in sacred theology on him. And in October 2012, he participated in the Synod on the New Evangelization for the Transmission of the Christian Faith as a synodal father appointed by the Pope. On September 2015, he wrote the book, La Bellezza Disarmata, The Unarmed Beauty, soon to be published in the US by Notre Dame Press. Joseph Weiler. Joseph Weiler is a university professor at NYU Law School and senior fellow at the Center for European Studies at Harvard. Until recently, he served as president of the European University Institute, Florence. Previously, he served as Manley Hudson Professor of International Law at the Harvard Law School. He is editor-in-chief of the European Journal of International Law and the International Journal of Constitutional Law. He holds a PhD in European Law from the EUI, Florence, and honorary doctorates from various European and American universities, including an honorary doctorate in theology from the Catholic University of America. He is the author of several books and articles in the field of European integration, international economic law, and comparative constitutional law. Thank you very much. I have to start with a, a wonderful joke, which you will see at the end relates to your book. So there's this uh, serious observant Jew, like myself, uh, who raises his children to be serious observant Jews. And at one point, he decides to send his son to Israel to improve his Hebrew and have the experience of being in Israel. And he sends his son. And when he comes back after four months, he's become a Christian. <laughs> so, so he goes to a friend of his. And this friend of his says, the same thing happened to me. I also sent my son to Israel. And after four months, my son came back. Uh, Let's go to the rabbi. So the rabbi says, I have to see what's going on. And he sends his son. And, and after four months, he comes back a Christian. <laughs> so the rabbi says, this is very, very strange. We have to go and ask God. So they God, go to God. And God says, this is very strange. I also sent my son. <laughs> How does this how, how does this relate to your book, uh, Julian? Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to let my sons the read Jewish it. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> uh, th this is going to be a conversation, and of course, uh, pride of place will be for Julian, but. He asked me to start by saying, uh, what are my impressions of the book? Because I, you sent it to me in draft, and then I read it when it came out in Italian, and now the, the last few days I've read the English translation, 
finishing it. I, I literally just came straight from the airport here after a 22 hour flight from Singapore. We need so, <laughs> We need to thank, to thank him for this gesture of friendship, because only somebody like Joseph can do something like that. 22 hours of trip to come here with us. So, oh, well, also to see my grandson. <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, so I'm 65 years old, and I've seen quite a bit in my life, but I think 2016 was a terrible year. I was in Florence, I was living in Europe then, and I don't think I have to tell you, just everything that could go wrong went wrong. The European Union, which is the central subject of my reflection in my professional life uh, seems to be going through the most difficult crisis. We had a lot of violence, the terrible story of Syria. Uh, we had terrorism in the heart of Europe, in France, in Germany, in other places. Uh, we had the migration crisis which the real crisis is the reaction to the migrants, not the migrants uh, themselves. We observing the rise of uh, movements which used to be on the fringe and now have become center. We suddenly, people speak with respectability of illiberal democracy which almost seems an oxymoron, really a very, very difficult year. So, the first impression of your book, in that difficult year, it was a kind of balm for the soul. Uh, not only the wonderful style, soft, caressing style of writing, which should not obscure uh, a very, very sharp message, but the approach is very soothing in some way. And the message, I think, is very important because uh, <clears throat> throughout, this cri throughout this crisis or these crises, uh, and this is not only something that uh, 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 is relevant to 2016, at least in Europe, apart from uh, very important statements from various popes, uh, the Christian voice seems to have sub subdued. Uh, it might be a conversation among Christians, but it's not a central part of the conversation mm -hmm. in the broader society. So to come up with this bold book, was already important in and of itself, and to my gratification, it received a lot of resonance in the general press. In other words, people whose faith is non-faith mm -hmm. uh, were impressed, thought it important, uh, discussed about it. And then, uh, when I come to the content, I, throughout the book, there you can think of, uh, Two, two, two audiences. Uh, one is, it's a message uh, to Christians. Uh, how should you be thinking of your faith? And not just in conceptual terms, but in the day-to-day -day life of faith. How does one confront this kind of reality through which we are living today? what should be one's attitude as a person of faith. Mm -hmm. And then, at the same time, uh, it's a very sort of old-fashioned word, but for want of a better one, there's a certain missionary dimension to this book. 
because it's not only how one should live one's life, but what should be one's life in relation to others. How does one communicate if you want in this disarming way the beauty uh, of the life of faith? And that is something that resonates beyond Catholicism, beyond Christianity, uh, I think to a much uh, broader audience. And finally, the way I read the book, uh, in their generosity, in their stupidity, uh, they have been inviting me now for 15 years to come to the meeting in Rimini. So, uh, it's been my way of having a certain engagement and even commitment and certainly a huge measure of sympathy to the movement of communion and liberation, although of course I'm not a member of that by definition. Mm -hmm. and, and I think your book also to me represents a certain shift in the understanding and perhaps even the self-understanding of communion and liberation. Uh, how it operates, how it thinks it's of itself, what its uh, message should be, and a change which the book both constitutes and reflects to judge from the last few meetings, which are quite different to the first meetings that I went starting 15 years ago. So there's quite a richness and quite a, a series of messages in a book which seems coming out exactly at the right time. So maybe the first thing I would ask you is, I remember the experience when uh, Pope Benedict published his two volumes on Jesus, volume one and volume two. Everybody bought them. But then I could not find anybody who actually read them. <laughs> Sometimes I had the impression I was the only person. <laughs> now, I don't think that's going to be the fate of your book. <laughs> but maybe... Could not be an exception. <laughs> but maybe your first thing, maybe give yourself, you know, a, like an extended tweet mm -hmm. of what you were trying to accomplish with this book. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, for years, uh, an Italian editor, Rizzoli, uh, has asked me for uh, a book uh, because uh, he was, or he is the, the publisher of Giussani's book, and wanted a book by the leader of the movement today. But at the, for years, I didn't have any particular interest of publishing another book. I, I didn't uh, feel any need to add uh, a book to my bibliography. No? I didn't care about that. I have uh, attacks now and that was uh, leading the movement, and I was enough for me. But uh, after 10 years of the Jalis death, um, because of the changes that was uh, happened in, in the society in, in the last years, uh, at the end, I gave up and accepted to, uh, to send to the publisher uh, uh, this book. That is a, a, a collect of different talk or intervention in different situations in which uh, there is a common ground from all of this uh, is, first of all, an attempt of 
verifying if Christian faith, my Christian faith, my faith uh, was capable of facing all the challenges that we as a Christian have to face in the modern world, no? in, the, in this uh, particularly challenging moment in all the issues that uh, Joseph uh, said before, violence, terrorism, uh, migration crisis, economical crisis, anthropological crisis, everything of these issues, uh, uh, education problem, uh, uh, educative emergency, we can say, no? All these kind of issues are uh, challenges that the, all the society uh, has to face. And uh, I am part of this society as a Christian. Uh, I wanted uh, to verify if this uh, faith now, facing this, uh, all these challenges, can be, can resist, no, in front of all these challenges, I can make a, a contribution to this uh, situation, no, uh, because as uh, Hannah Arendt uh, describes, uh, a crisis, uh, right here, here uh, force us back to the questions themselves and requires from us either new and old answers. But in any case, direct judgments. A crisis becomes a disaster only when we respond to it with performed judgments, that is prejudices. Such an attitude not only sharpens the crisis, but makes us forfeit the experience of reality and the opportunity for reflection it provides. I think this is true. A crisis is something that forces us to think about the things to think about the challenges, to think about uh, the way we are living, the way we are uh, uh, coping with the, the difficulties, the problem that we have to face, uh, became a, like an opportunity for everybody. An opportunity, not only some kind of disgrace, some kind of obstacle, some kind of uh, fatum, no? but some opportunity to, to think about, to rethink uh, the things, uh, updating uh, all our conception, a way of understanding better what is life about, and what is reality, and what is uh, the meaning of life, and what is the, 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 the foundation of the society. All these kind of things are at stake in that particular moment in history. So, I wanted with this book to verify if Christian faith uh, could resist in front of these challenges and make a contribution. First of all, to verify my faith. First of all, it was not, not a problem for the others. It's, but what I am believed, what I believe really, can be talked in a big audiences like that, in the public domain, or it's only something that is reduced to my private room or in my private domain, in my personal life, or it could be a proposal that can be, culturally speaking, in front of everybody. And this is what I uh, try 
uh, offering this book to, to the press. And the, the summary uh, of the book is a presentation of these challenges and as a first uh, gaze to the reality with all these kind of issues that Joseph uh, <coughs> mentioned before, and uh, trying to understand what, they, what are the roots of, of this situation in which we uh, find now. And uh, the second big uh, chapter uh, is Christian faith. Uh, has something to offer as an answer to these challenges or not? And this is a way of presenting Christianity as a, um, uh, or, um, as a original uh, approach. What is Christianity about? Not only a set of rules, not only a uh, elencus of uh, Christian dogmas, but as an event that can uh, reawake uh, the, the people, person, uh, every person, and uh, start again uh, alive, uh, trying to, to generate a way of living in the reality as a human being. And this is the, the opportunity to face another big chapter of the book, uh, the education question, what is the, uh, the, one of the most important challenges that society, the, uh, the present society had before it, because uh, the generation of um, a new society depends on the possibility of educating people children and youth in, in a way of living in the reality that cannot end up in, in violence or in a, uh, emptiness life that could be the, the, the occasion for finishing in the violence or uh, in uh, a chaos in the society. Um, Afterwards, I face some of the some of the issues of this debate, like um, family or uh, uh, politics or uh, different kind of uh, answers to the needs of the society today. I'm finishing with a uh, what is the possibility of a new beginning in this situation in which we are living. This is... Thank you. So let, let's try and concretize it. And one of the most evocative chapters in your book is called The Challenge of True Dialogue After Charlie Hebdo Attacks. Mm -hmm. And Charlie Hebdo Attacks is followed by Bataclan, by Copenhagen, by Nice, by Berlin, so it was not a unique uh, phenomenon. So what do you mean by the challenge of true dialogue in the face of this kind of events? This is a, a, a good example to understand what is, uh, what is happening in our society, because many times we can uh, look at this phenomenon like some particular issue that is related to, uh, with some people. But uh, I was thinking a lot about this issue and reading a lot of commentaries trying to understand what is the origin of this uh, terrorist attack, no? because many times it's reduced uh, like a religious problem uh, or uh, as a psychological problem of somebody. Uh, but this is... Uh, these are, I think, uh, exp uh, superficial explanation of something that, is, that has a uh, deepest root uh, in the society, because uh, some kind of this explanation can um, be useful 
to explain some of the issues, but not others. No? And for instance, uh, if only is an Islam problem, we can say that uh, it could be part of the issue, but at the same time there are uh, uh, French or Spanish or German citizens that uh, decided to unite and sell to the ISIS. And this is not a problem of uh, Islam question. What is the origin of this? Why uh, these people from different Originally different, uh, originally different background, can decided to join themselves to this uh, group of violence, and I think uh, that um, the original question is not only about a religious one. The, the, the people who were born in France. For instance, we were talking about Charlie Hebdo, uh, arrived uh, years ago, uh, bringing with them their own faith in Islam religion. But they have the same problem that many Christian families. They didn't uh, got, get the possibility uh, of transmitting uh, his belief to the next generation. The secularization is not a problem only for Christians, it's, only, it's as well for another kind of religions. And many of them uh, finish uh, without any root, any point of reference. And the second generation of this emigrants uh, live in a emptiness and that was the origin uh, in which uh, can uh, root the, the violence. No? And they decided with another Western citizen because all of them were born in France, all of them were uh, students in the schools of France, educated in the values of the Republican uh, society. But there was not enough to generate or to be in front of something that was so attractive to change uh, his their attitude. And this is my question in that moment, no? but what they uh, find when some people arrive to our society? What kind of life? They, do they find something that, us, that is uh, interesting enough to overcome the, 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 the tendency of um, violence. This is not a religious problem. This is, could be a part of the religious problem, but it's a problem of society. And this is a problem that is related to everybody of us. Something that is not for one part of another. It's a problem that all the society, all society, all kind of institution, all kind of cultural environment, all of us are in front of this challenge. And for this, uh, I uh, ask in, in, in that moment, what could be a possibility to overcome this? Uh, and this is the, the question that we have now in Europe, where, where we have, where you have now here in, in different ways, in not only a, a problem of economic crisis or only a superficial question, is the root of a new beginning that we need to, to think about in order to answer to this 
question. Allora, uh, then uh, I think that only if Europe or the United States or whatever part in the world became a space for freedom uh, in which everyone can be attractive for something beautiful, beautiful enough to, to overcome the, the tendency of, to violence, can overcome this uh, violence anywhere. For that, I uh, ask myself and all the Christians in that moment uh, this question. Do we Christians still believe in the capacity of the faith we have received to attract those who encounter, those who arrive to our countries? Do we believe in the living fascination of he defenses beauty of our faith. This is my, and this is the challenges we have as a Christian before us. But not only we as a Christian, all the society. If we don't have an answer to this, I don't know how can we will stop this phenomenon. Let me push back a little bit, and I, I want to push back. I remember having the same feeling when I very, for the first time I read the first iteration of that chapter on Charlie Hebdo, because I don't think it's your intention, but I think it could be read in that way or understood in that way, that uh, your interest is in the locally grown, mm -hmm. the French, the German, the Belgium, etc., who faced with what you say the emptiness mm -hmm. of existence, and then suddenly this kind of message seems attractive to them. And uh, at the end of your story, you say there has to be some kind of alternative, the, the beauty of. But, What's your take on responsibility? Because one gets the impression it's not their fault, it's society's fault. Mm -hmm. And you're absolving people for responsibility for their actions because they grew up in a society which, whatever its ills, its emptiness, etc. And it goes back to the sort of therapeutic society. Somebody does something very bad and you immediately ask, what's the reason? He grew up in a society which didn't give value. Mm -hmm. I have a problem with the notion of responsibility that underlines your analysis. It's not only uh, that all uh, the responsibility we can apply to the society, no? but it is important, according to, me, to my impression, that if somebody, uh, everybody needs something that uh, make meaningful life. And it is part of the education process. No? To be a father, to be a mother, is not only uh, to conceive a, a baby. No? This is part of the question. But this is not fully a fatherhood. A fatherhood is as well uh, together with the, the gift of life is to give a child uh, a meaning for this life. I always in the past uh, made an example. If somebody uh, makes a gift to his son, no? Uh, a device, a technological device, no? for instance, uh, and you don't know, you don't offer some hypothesis, of, a working hypothesis to explain him what is the way in it is the device can work. What is 
the attitude of the child. He can try to react in front of this device without understanding how the device works. So the question is that without that meaning, even the, the most important gift of life uh, could be used in a way that is not enough to, to be only as a reaction. It's not because they are not responsible. It's a reaction according to what he uh, can see in, in this moment. Well, this is the, the importance of the society that uh, for this reason, when somebody uh, makes a device offer in the, in the boss some instruction to uh, help the child to understand how it works. But we, are, um, we have arrived to the life with a gift, life, but we don't have any instruction in the box. What is the instruction for living? How can we deal with the meaning of life? And this is the, the, the way in which uh, we have received the meaning of life, that we, we, don't, we didn't have some kind of instruction when we were born, but we were born in a family, in a, in a country. Uh, if this family and this country have a richness no, of all history in which they have uh, learned a lot about the meaning of life, about how to deal with the problem, with the illness, with the difficulties, with the discovery. And uh, when we offer something uh, to, the, to this child, through the family, through the society, through the school, no? we are offering some kind of working hypothesis to understand how life works. And this is a possibility. Without this, uh, we return to the past like uh, without uh, uh, any possibility of increasing our awareness, not because the people uh, don't have any responsibility, but they can be educated to grow in their own awareness, to learn a way of dealing with the reality in a meaningful way. To, to use your set of metaphors, so if we think of the Christian way of life as a kind of user's manual for life, mm -hmm. the kind of set of instructions that you have, how, what is your advice, what is your thought, what is your conception of how people who follow that user's manual, who have that set of instructions, who believe in it, what is the way they reach outside the Christian community? Mm -hmm. Because in Europe, with the exception of a few countries, maybe Poland, maybe one or two others, it's a very, very secular society. In, in, in the United Kingdom, every weekend, there are more people who go to mosque than there are people who go to church. Mm -hmm. uh, even though if you look at the absolute numbers, that's a really dramatic statistic. So <clears throat> how does one reach beyond the internal Christian community to offer this user's manual. What's the method? And that's one of the innovations of your book. This is a, a, a crucial point because this uh, situation that we are living now in a uh, multicultural society no, in which we are living because in many of these countries that you uh, are cited, quoted now, uh, were more homogeneous in the past. Now are all of them are uh, multicultural, no? But uh, not always Christianity has uh, found itself 
in this situation. At the beginning, Christianity uh, was born in a multicultural society, in the, Palest in, the, in the Palestine of the first century, it was a multicultural society. There are a lot of different groups of Jews uh, with different approach. When the Christianity goat went out of the Palestine uh, territory, uh, and, uh, it was open no, to the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was a multicultural society. They, they were, uh, Christianity, it was a small group no, of people in which, uh, without any relevance at that moment. Uh, so, it was one among other gods in the pantheon of the, uh, uh, the pantheon of religion at that moment. So, Christianity has not been the, in every occasion in the same situation as we have in the, the recent past. Uh, the society uh, was very different at the beginning of Christianity. And, and Christianity uh, was one of the, uh, was widespread all around the Roman Empire with different ways, many times through people that are uh, no relevant people, slaves or soldiers or merchants or uh, traders, or, no? Because of the, 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 the daily life uh, trips or the, the daily life circumstances, they, people come, who could, meet, who could meet Christianity in the daily life uh, by the newness that these people uh, live in the, in the way in which they were uh, um, dealing with the normal challenges of everybody. So, uh, it's not our society the, the only way, you know, a homogeneous society is not the only way of conveying Christianity. Okay. And, and in this what is relevant is that this period, these 300 uh, years from the beginning of Christianity, was one of the most missionary uh, centuries in the history of Christianity. It, not, it was not a problem, this kind of situation, because it's not the, the, the power of the uh, Christian present, is the diversity what makes missionary the church. So the book has definitely got a very strong missionary streak to it. But where I'm pressing you is to elaborate, to explicate, to bring to life. So what is the form that this missionary mission should take? I mean, is it like the Mormons knocking on people's doors? No. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, I, I thought that would be your reply, so, <clears throat> so, 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 so tell us, if somebody leaves this room and said, yes, uh, I understand that we cannot just be inward looking, we have to be outward looking, we have something not simply to say to society in terms of values, but say to people in terms of the way of life they should be leading. Uh, how does one make that leap? What does one do? I can tell you some examples of this. For instance, uh, a friend of mine uh, who is uh, married and live with another family uh, was surrounded by people who didn't want to get married at all, no? Because of different reasons, not because we were against and the family values or because uh, were angry against the church or the, no, it was because many of them have a, a difficult experience of family, you know, for instance, because they belong to a family in which 
uh, all the, the, the relationships were broken in, in, in the family in which they grew up, and they don't want to do, to do anything with the family, no? And they want uh, 20 different families without any desire to become a family in a, well, we can say, Christian conception. And nobody uh, pushes them to change their mind. Only they became friends. And sharing the life, in a moment, uh, uh, seeing the beauty of the family, all this family around can see in this family of my friends, little by little, all of them, each one after another, decided to become a family. There is no preach, there is no dog to the, to the door. It's only uh, that the beauty is contagious because you can find something and you decide to adhere to this because the beauty of a family life live in such a new way, uh, they didn't want to lose. Not because they, are, they were pushed to become coherent with a Christian conception, because they didn't want to lose the beauty of a family life that they didn't know before they met these friends. And from this, we can see uh, people who met another one in the work that is dealing with the, the challenges of the world in a way that he can imagine to do, and the other with the illness, and the other with the difficulties in, in the relationship with the friends, and the other with the difficulty in his financial issues, is only the beauty that is so contagious that when somebody meets this beauty, uh, people cannot resist to follow, to, um, to adhere to this beauty because, not for religious issues, but because of the beauty that they don't want to, to miss. Testimony, example. Testimony. Testimony. Uh, and this is crucial in this particular moment because we are in a society in which the most important value is freedom. Uh, and this is, testimony is the only thing that can be respectful with the freedom. No? Not only something that we can impose to another, but something uh, that we can put before them, challenging them with this beauty. For this is the title of the book, Disarming Beauty, that something that can be so powerful no, that they make uh, collapse all the objections because of the attractiveness of this beauty. They should not come to my family on Saturday lunch. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. <laughs> There's something implicit in in this method of testimony, of example, of just people seeing that there's something deep and attractive. You also, throughout the book, you are a little bit reticent about political engagement. Mm -hmm. Am I, am I right in saying that? Yes, I, political engagement is, is part of the, of the interest for the common good. No? This political engagement can have different uh, way of commitment, you know, because we can uh, answer with a particular work, with a particular initiative to answer a need, you know? or to engage yourself uh, in our political service for the good, for the common good. So, uh, political is, according to the, to the Pope, uh, 
Jean Paul II is the, 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 most, uh, the, the most caritatable gesture that we can do for the community, for the… And so, the, the question is that we can understand uh, political service just like a service, no? and we can offer uh, a contribution to the common good, because uh, only if somebody is really rooted in, 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 a, with, in a experience of faith that can make him free from all uh, temptation of power, uh, you can offer really a contribution to the common good. Otherwise, you use the power for your own satisfaction, not for the uh, common good. That, that, that was an excellent answer because my question was wrong. I should not have said a reticence towards politics, but a reticence towards going to bed with power talking about family. Yeah, so politics, yes, but a certain distance from power. Mm -hmm. uh, no, with, a, with a conception of power, not distance of power, it's a new conception of power. The, the power is to, uh, as a service to the community of power is uh, to serve yourself to your own sake not for the sake of the others, not for the sake of the community, of the society. So, so there are two already, even in your uh, words until now, and certainly in the book, there are two kind of light motifs. Mm. One is education and the other is family. Yes. Let's just talk a little bit about the family. So uh, how do you see the crisis of the family? Uh, here I can put in my two bits. For me, it's... The central issue is not uh, same-sex marriage or even the horrific drama of abortion, but it's uh, the fact that increasingly people don't make children. Mm -hmm. They have very small families. Uh, this somebody is a, said a to good me, question. how can you have more than three children? Automobiles only have five seats in them. So. Mm -hmm. This is a reply, actually, I got at uh, one of the meetings. So, how do you understand the crisis of family today in uh, what we used to call the West? Can I uh, you tell, us, uh, tell you some anecdotes about this? Now, because when I uh, presented this book in Torino, in an Italian city in the north of, it of Italy, uh, the director of one newspaper, Mario Calabresi, uh, told us uh, some story about his family. No? Uh, his uh, grandfather, who has seven children, uh, 21 grandchildren, uh, was listening in a family feast 10 years ago. Um, was listening the conversation between two of their cousins in, in their 50s. One of them says, now I am waiting for them to change my contract at work so that my wife and I can move, and maybe after a while we can think about having a child. When all was settled, maybe we can decide to have a child. My grandfather, usually mild-mannered, gets very angry and invites them if they want to continue to talk along this, those lines to resume their conversation out on the staircase. But why, Grandpa? What did you say? What do we, did we say? He studied then and said flatly, if I followed that same logic, your parents 
who were born during the war, in the first world war, uh, in some of the hardest times, would never have been born. And neither would, and neither would the two of you be born. And this celebration today would not be so beautiful. Years ago, people can become father or mother, even in, during the war. Now we need to settle everything in the house, no? To decide to become a father or a mother. What happened in, from this, in this short period of time? This is what we are trying to understand. What is, what has, what is happening? Uh, in the last decade that uh, we can see this collapse of things that not so much time ago, it was so clear for them. And, uh, but now the question is that these uh, people not even became aware of what they are saying, I mean, what was the, the origin of the anger of the grandfather. They don't, didn't understand. And this is the question that we need to, to understand because this, the family is only one example of uh, what is happening. And for me, has been a illuminating a text of um, Pope Benedict XVI in which he analyzes the, the, the origin of our society. In the situation of confessional antagonism and in the, cris, the crisis that threatened uh, the image of God, uh, illuminism, the enlightenment, no? you can imagine all Europe and all Western Europe uh, was united by Christian religion. In a moment, this religion was broken by re Reformation. And after the Reformation arrived the so-called uh, uh, religious war. And we need, after this particular crisis, a new foundation. And what is the basis for the new foundation. Uh, enlightened thinkers thought that the foundation should be the Christian value that, he have, that they have received from the tradition. But because of the fight between different denominations of uh, in the, in the Christian church, there was no possibility to do, that, to do that. And so they tried, said Benedict XVI, tried to keep, to save the essential moral values outside the controversies and to identify an evidential quality in these values that would make them independent of the many divisions and uncertainties of philosophy. At that time, continues the Pope, this was thought to be possible, since the great fundamental convictions created by Christianity were largely resistant to attack and seemed undeniable what happened in the last century. What we have seen now, what we are seeing now is the collapse of this, that they separated from the root, no? the reserve for this kind of reassuring certainty, something that could go unchallenged despite all disagreements, had not succeeded, said the Pope. This is a, was a failure. And it is what we are seeing in all the domains, the family or the freedom of the, even now uh, some 
people start to speak like Bauman about the failure of democracy or some values that until now were self-evident for everybody, the family or the life or the freedom. And now we are starting to recognize that it's not so evident for everybody. And this is the chaos that we are uh, in that particular moment. And so, uh, what is the origin? I think that one of the more insightful analysis of this is one uh, Catholic theologian uh, that in the night in the 40s, the last century, said that uh, the attention of modern society, illumination, enlightening society, often present a number of values uh, that were Christian in origin, but uh, cut off these values from their source, from their origin, they were powerless powerless to maintain them in the full strength and even in their authentic integrity. Spirit, reason, liberty, truth, brotherhood, justice, these great things without which there is no true humanity, which ancient paganism hath have perceived and Christianity hath instituted, quickly became unreal. But, and this is the family with life and all But in things. this respect, therefore, when I look to the future and I read you carefully and I reflect, I'm quite pessimist. Because if we focus on the family, mm -hmm. so, and if one accepts my own premise before that the true crisis of the family is that people are not making big families, it's mm -hmm. very nucleus, etc. So, so I see four <clears throat> factors which explain the difference between communities of faith and non-communities of faith. The first, the people love their children and they want the best for their children. Mm -hmm. And they worried about the future of their mm -hmm. children. But in the community of faith, you remember when uh, John Paul II, in his very first speech when he became Pope, he said, it's important not to be afraid. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, the community of faith in some way are not afraid. They, they have a certain confidence in the future. And secondly, it's a counterculture to the spirit of the Enlightenment or Neo-Kantianism of today. It's not a culture which is based only on rights and more rights and what are my rights and rights are so important and they are, but also on duty and responsibility. Absolutely. So that is the second explanation of why you don't find the same phenomenon in certain communities of faith. And the third thing is, let's be open about it, it's a less materialist view of life. So you're not worried if not every one of your children will have an iPad. Uh, it's okay if they share it. The materialist premise is much less powerful. And the last and is that in the act of making children, one is participating with God in creating life. Mm -hmm. But that is a religious sensibility. Mm -hmm. It's a sort of shared endeavor in the creation of life. And somehow, I don't see, even by example and by testimony, that those four factors will spill over to communities who are not communities of faith. But this is the real the challenge, no? How can we overcome this fear, no? Why are we afraid of this? How can we overcome materialism? How can we overcome only to, the need to be everything settled to have a child? What is the, the, the way of overcome these kind of challenges? Because otherwise, we take for granted what, what is the origin of the problem. 
because if people prefer uh, a new television instead of uh, having a child, uh, it's useless. No? It cannot be only a preach no? that can change their mind. They need to, to have something, to meet something, to uh, encounter something that can be more interesting for life than to buy another uh, new television. No? And this is what is at stake no? in our society, that not only we can push uh, saying responsibility, because the question is that people uh, are not listening to this kind of appeal to ethics. No? And it's useful to keep appealing to ethics, but the question is sufficient, it is enough to move the deepest part of the heart of somebody uh, to change their own mind? This is my question, because this is what is at stake, because many people in the church have received this kind of encouragement, no? uh, and all of them have received that they need to have a children or they have not to be afraid of the, of the circumstances of the society, of the challenges, but this appeal only not to be afraid or not to be materialistic is not enough to overcome the temptation of materialism that we can see in the society. And this is our question. How can we offer something that can be more interesting for us that accumulate other things and to offer a possibility to a new life can come to the world. So my experience, I've always seen it halfway. My wife tells me a million times it has happened to her. People come to her and say, oh, it's so wonderful. I'm so jealous of you. You had five children. I mean, isn't it? And she looks at them and says, so why don't you have it? And oh, well. <laughs> Uh, let's move to education because the clock is pushing us. Pushing us. Uh, when you say the educational challenge and also Giuseppe himself, uh, what do you mean? Changing the curriculum at school? No. No. No, but I think it is another important issue no? because uh, everybody keeps speaking about the, the challenge of education. The, uh, educative emergency. The, the, the use of this word emergency no, of education uh, is significant because uh, we can recognize that it's not one of the, the problem, but it's the problem no, in education system. And the, the question for me is how can we reawake the, the young or the children in order that they can be interested. When I was a teacher years ago, uh, I find crucial that I started to, to be a professor of re Christian religion. And even though the school was uh, Christian and Catholic, uh, not everybody there in my room or in my class was interested in. And there are not people who expect or are waiting the teacher to accept all the uh, things that he decided to offer them. We, as a teacher, need to awake the interest for the issue. And this is crucial. It's not a problem of curriculum, it's a problem of how can we convey this interest for what we are trying to, to communicate them. And this is at all levels, not only in the, the Christian religion class, but in the mathematics or in the responsibility that they have to assume is a way of reawakening again the human being in order that they can understand that it's better to live in a way or in another. And this is the real challenge. But at the same time, 
the problem of the, the youth people is uh, the problem of ad adult people. Because the question is, if we as, a, as an adult have some working hypothesis that could be interesting for others, for real people, not only because we can say that we are, uh, uh, we have the truth that they need to accept for the reason they accept it. We need to, to convey this in a way so attractive that they can be exacted, being exalted, his reason, his freedom, uh, to recognize that that way of living is more interesting for them than the other one. And this is the real challenge for uh, education in the, at the level of the family, or at the level of the school, or at the level of the universities, or at the level of the church, or the part, political parties, or the cultural institution. It's an uh, overall question for everybody. I, I see that, you know, they put this huge thing in front of us to remind us of the time passing. And that, so, that, at the end. I come to maybe what might be a last question. I, I will shut my ears mm -hmm. and I will invite you not to speak about disarming beauty, but to speak about arming beauty. Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> both you and Giuseppe have a particular message to, to Christians. Mm -hmm. of how to understand their faith, how to live it. And maybe the very last conclusion to your book is called, How Does a Presence Come to Be? Mm -hmm. So while I'm not listening, you tell them, mm -hmm. what is that conception of how does a presence mm -hmm. come to be? The, the presence comes to be only for an encounter with somebody in which the life can be changed. No? Uh, only if Christians can testify, can become really a witness of a new life, this new life can be visible. We all Christians uh, have been celebrating the Christmas time. No? And the liturgy uh, uh, play with two different words, invisible and visible. The invisible God has become visible, tangible. Christianity only can be uh, find somebody in the society, in, in a colleagues, in a family life, if it's tangible. And it's tangible where? Not in the, in the cathedral, in the in the rocks, or in a cathedral, or in the past, or in the Bible, no, not even in some books of the past, but in a presence, in a person who is changed by the encounter with Christ. Only this can be the origins, the new beginning of a new understanding of Christianity. Because the only thing that we have at hand is the present, the present time. Only in the present can be uh, la, the possibility of, recover, of recovering the past, the importance of the past. Yusanis always said that only an encounter in the present can be the way of uh, discovering what Christianity is about. Why? Because the first way in which Jesus started Christianity was encountering John and Andrew, the first two that met him. And Christianity will be always according to this pattern an encounter with an exceptional present in which we can see that what we are looking for is present before us. Thank you very much, Don Julian Carranza.